our first talk is Luke Smith. He's going to be doing a talk, I believe, on Monero. Uh, it's called, is the, is the best cryptocurrency good enough for grandma yet? So I don't know. I hope that's about Monero, but we will, we will see. Uh, so guys, give it up for Luke. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I kind of assume I'm preaching to the choir that if we hear best cryptocurrency, we, we, we naturally think Monero, but you never actually know. Um, so last year when I was at Monerotopia, I'm gonna move this because I don't, I don't know if I like it there. Last time when I was at Monerotopia, I, I think I tried to make the case for Monero in general as opposed to Bitcoin and stuff like that. So I wanna follow up on that. Uh, in the, when that, even if we have the best thing with Monero, even if we've converged on the best cryptocurrency out there that offers all the benefits of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system and has the privacy that Bitcoin doesn't and have, has a bunch of other benefits that Bitcoin doesn't, you know, the blocks, the variable block size and all this kind of stuff. Is that actually good enough for grandma? Um, and what I mean by that is, is a normal person actually going to ever use this? Um, now that of course is a painful question for a lot of people in cryptocurrency because I think the nagging answer in our head is usually actually no. Uh, like however far things have come, there's a lot of stuff and I, I'm gonna talk about, what, I guess put my finger on the issues, I think. I wanna talk about the issues that are preventing mass adoption of cryptocurrency, why, why it's still like a kind of obscure thing. So um, now I, uh, you know, this came to my mind. I'm just gonna tell you some personal stuff about myself. So I have this cousin and my cousin wears a kilt. OK, I, this is kind of hard to explain. He, he like has some vague amount of Scottish ancestry, Irish ancestry as well. And he's, he's very old worldsy. And so he literally wears a kilt. He has three of them. He wears them every day. He wears them to work. He wears them outside. It's just his new eccentric thing. He's been doing this for a couple of years. I don't know um, why I mentioned this is I was actually at his house. But, you know, after, I guess, Monerotopia last year uh, in January, I went to his house and of course he was uh, he had this Burns night party. I don't know if any of you guys are Scottish or anything, but in Scotland, there's this very national holiday called Burns night. And he puts one on every year. And of course he has all these scotches and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the night, everyone else is gone except for me. And um, he was extremely drunk and he just came to me and he was like, okay, Luke, I, I just don't get it. Could you explain Bitcoin to me? How does it work? Like what, what is going on with Bitcoin? Why, why would anyone, I, I don't get it. Where does it get its value from? What's the point? Why, why is it worth so much? And he is, of course, totally plastered. Um, and he's actually watching, oh, well, uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about everything, but um, so I'm in this position where I have this person at his worst, you know, he's, he's very drunk, very hard to uh, get anything tr through to him. Um, and I try, I try to drop it. I tried to be like, oh yeah, it works because of this, but he was very insistent. No, really, I wanna know exactly how Bitcoin and Monero and cryptocurrencies work. So I was sitting there for hours, actually trying to explain this guy in a kilt, uh, who was extremely drunk, how Monero, like not just how Bitcoin works, but why Monero is preferred and why you need privacy and why block, you know, you have uh, all these issues with uh, public blockchains and stuff like that. Um, and it didn't go over I, as well as I think I can explain it to a normal person. And of course, I've had many conversations with normal people and it goes over well. Uh, I don't think we're quite there with him. So uh, now, of course, a lot of people in Monero, right? And a lot of people in cryptocurrency, uh, they, they're very like well-read on certain things. There are a lot of libertarians. And I think there's this like tendency to be like, oh, well, you want to know how it works? Well, here, read Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State. Or read this like literature on like, you know, why the fiat currency system is like going to go, going down the drain or something like that. Um, and so a lot of cryptocurrency people, they just think differently than I think a normal person does. Um, now that would have been a bad example. It would have been a bad thing for me to sit and have a crash course with my cousin about, oh, well, actually, why, do fiat, why does fiat currency have you know, value? It doesn't, it's not really backed by anything. Bitcoin is at least verifiably scarce, but uh, you know, fiat currency is not. Um, so that's something that appeals to us a lot of the times, but it's not something that appeals to, to other people in the world, right? Oh, thank you, there's my breakfast. Um, I probably won't eat this while I'm presenting, but I, I am tempted. Okay, so now in uh, cryptocurrency, one of my favorite little metrics that people use is the so-called fear and greed index. I don't know if you guys, have, oh, that little, can I get rid of this? 
This is annoying me. I don't know how it works. I don't know. Um, so one of the favorite, my, one of my favorite little metrics in like Bitcoin is the so-called fear greed index. And it's basically like, you know, people will use all this funny stuff in like uh, analyzing stocks and cryptocurrencies where there's like, uh, I don't know, uh, oh, they use like Fibonacci numbers and all this kind of stuff. But the fear greed index is basically like, are people afraid of having Bitcoin right now? Do they think it's going down or are they greedy for, greedy for it? Um, and as people who are kind of more interested in it, I, I think that fear is kind of a, 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 I don't know, a scary word. I don't so much like it. So I prefer to call this the I'm in it for the tech versus uh, greed index. So when things are bad, you usually start saying stuff like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm in cryptocurrency because of the technology. That's that's what I'm in for it for. But that, I, as everyone knows, that's just kind of kind of a cope. Um, in reality, so what I really want to talk about is the final boss of crypto. A lot of people, they're talking about central bank, you know, uh, digital currencies and all this kind of stuff, regulatory issues, and all of that stuff is fine. But the biggest, the final boss of crypto, once you beat all of those other bosses, is this. Boomers, okay? There are a lot of normal people who just... It, it, Bitcoin is so, and Monero are just so out of their radar. It's so confusing. They don't quite know how it is. They don't know how to get into it. And I want to discuss why exactly that is an issue. So the first, um, oh, well, thank you. Are you going to get rid of, oh, now it's even worse. Oh, no. Okay. No. Oh, no, spoilers. Okay. Uh, maybe we can ignore that. Anyway, so, so boomers, when it comes to boomers, um, so here's here's the issue. Um, when it comes to getting everyone in Monero or cryptocurrency has been in this position where you want to you want to convince some like you have someone sold on the facts of the case. OK, here we have this technology which is totally free software. It's decentralized. It's not run by an individual party and anyone can use it. it it's free to get into the system and all that kind of stuff. Um, but even once you sold someone that. It's a whole nother thing to try and get the, okay, well, how do I get Monero? How do I get Bitcoin? That is legitimately a difficult question to answer to a normal answer for a normal person. And why is it? Because a lot of the times, the people who are in cryptocurrency, if you think about it, a lot of them have been in it for a long time. So they have Bitcoin from five years ago. So it's easy for them to get Monero. Oh, I'll just switch, switch some over on this random site. Whereas for a normal person nowadays to get Monero, I mean, it, it, there's an, there's a very strong irony in it when you think about it, okay? Because here you are as a Monero guy, you're like, well, man, you don't want to use know your customer exchanges. Those are bad. You don't want to give your identity to anyone. Oh, and also Bitcoin, you know, it's totally screwed up. Like uh, the government can monitor you because all transactions are public, yada, yada, yada. That's all true. But then once, once, even if, once you've convinced someone of that, you're in a position where still the easiest way to get someone cryptocurrency is literally just to sign up to a know your customer customer exchange, get Bitcoin, and then transfer it onto some site where you can get Monero off of it. And so there's some hilarious hypocrisy where a lot of people in Monero will be like, oh, this is the greatest thing you have to get into it. But we really do not have a good way for people to get Monero in an easy way. And there are lots of great attempts at this. You know, there are lots of decentralized exchanges, but things like local Monero or something like that. But it's hard to sign someone who looks, wait, is it? Oh, it's not even up. Oh, it's working on the stream. Okay. All right. Stream. Everyone in the stream can, you know, follow on. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just leave you guys to figure that out. Um, what was I going to say? So when you're talking to a normal person who, uh, who is in that position, that is something fundamentally difficult to, to get through them. Right. Okay. So the biggest issue is onboarding, as I said, um, oh man, now a lot of my jokes, if you can't see it, they're not going to go through, but that's all right. That's fine. All right. Is it is it off? Can we? Do we need to take a? We can take a break if. Eat your food. Oh yeah, I'll eat my food. Okay. Can we like pause the stream for a second? All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Just to reiterate, for those that just walked in, we had we had some technical difficulties. Luke's talk got cut off in the middle of it. He's going to wrap up his talk, and then we'll have Andreas. For those watching at home, what was previously the remote remote links or the remote stage is now the live stage. So we will be sending out a new link to all of you for the second stage. But for now, enjoy the remaining talk from Luke. Take it away. All right. Great, great. Again, sorry, sorry for the technical difficulties of which I was a contributor. I'm sorry. 
Um, all right, so I was talking about the issue of onboarding people into Monero, right? Because once you've sold someone on it, it's a whole nother thing to actually get them, get them actual Monero, because most of the time people who use it are people who have had Bitcoin since whenever. It's, they just have had it. They haven't had to get KYC. They haven't do, had to do anything else. Um, and they just swap their Bitcoin for Monero and it's very easy. Um, whereas to, you, to get Monero in the ideal way today, right? Um, a lot of times you have to use one of these sites that like local Monero that is basically like Craigslist for crypto. And a lot of people, frankly, are just not comfortable for that. Um, so just to skip a little further ahead, I think like one rule of thumb, when, when you're talking about reaching normal people, you have to remember if it takes two steps, it's too much, right? That, that's my way of looking at it. Um, because, you know, when you think about a, a good example, like people of my generation that are more technically inclined, we, it's very natural for us to, for example, watch television shows on a computer. Okay, that's a trivial thing. Whereas to people of former generations, that actually is something extremely difficult. And it only requires, oh, let me, you know, uh, hook up my computer to an HDMI and put it on the screen or something like that. Something that to us is very simple, but to a lot of people, that is just too many steps. That, that, that's a level of difficulty that they, they can't necessarily handle. Um, so that's why a lot of the things that, again, technically inclined people, things that are easy for us are not necessarily easy for your average person. Um, all right, so uh, now I'm, I'm just gonna skip through this part because we're a little pressed for time. Um, but I, I think we should look at these issues as being an opportunity because the reality is Monero as it exists right now, um, honestly, like the worst thing that could happen for it is for it to be mass adopted today. The technology is always evolving. That's actually built into, oh, thank you, is that for me? Yeah. Wow, that's, that's a lot of water. Um, so the technology is developing in, in such a way that we couldn't handle having everyone on the globe using Monero right now. The technology doesn't exist, it's being developed, right? Um, so just to give like kind of uh, the technological flaws just in like one sentence or like a, a way of looking at it. Um, does any, anyone actually know what this is? So, so th this is actually an Aztec relic. Famously, so one, one famous thing about pre-Columbian civilization is that, you know, the consensus is um, they didn't use wheels for things like carts and carriages and things like this. Part of that is they didn't have pack animals like to do uh, stuff like that, but they didn't have wheelbarrows and things like that. Wheels were never used in an industrial fashion, but wheels, they actually did use wheels in children's toys and things like that. Um, and that, that's interesting to us because we look at the wheel as just, oh, it's such a basic invention. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Um, but it's very easy for humans to just totally be ignorant of, or just totally overlook a technical issue, like a technical solution um, to a problem and for generations, for thousands of years. That's actually a very normal thing. We can't, you know, the Aztecs and all pre-Columbian civilization obviously had a pretty complex society that we can't knock just because they didn't use wheels in the way we did. But you, the way to look at it is we are actually exactly like that. There are so many technical solutions to problems that we don't, that might be obvious, like looking back at it. And why I mentioned this is, um, you know, Monero, uh, I'm going to skip, skip through some of that. But, you know, some of the issues that we, we face in Monero, like uh, the issue of blockchains in themselves, right? So blockchain, blockchains, when you think about it, all they are, are, are really the proof of work system that Bitcoin, that developed in Bitcoin. All that is, is a Nash equilibrium that pulls human behavior in such a way that we can have a decentralized currency without a central party telling you what to do, okay? That is now the proof of work system, all the silly Bitcoin mining, all that kind of stuff, Monero mining, all the computers that are used in that. When you really step back and look at it, it, it's kind of wasteful. And I'm not even saying that in like an ecological sense. I'm saying it in the sense that it's perfectly possible that there are technical solutions in the same way that the wheel wasn't obvious for many people in the past that we are overlooking as well. And so a little teenager who has an idea of how to reach decentralized consensus could do so in such a way that totally throws out the window all the, all the technical issues uh, or all the, the problems that we, we now take for granted in Monero. Um, so I kind of said that. Uh, one, one example, just, you know, this is my, I, I don't have a stake in this. Uh, one cryptocurrency, I wouldn't say I like, but I, I kind of like the idea of the, the technology. I don't have any of this, but 
uh, is Nano. So Nano is actually a good example where it doesn't even use blockchains at all. It uses what's called block lattices. And effectively, instead of having like every transaction of Bitcoin stored or Monero stored on your computer, you actually only have transactions that are relevant to you. And the system, basically, you send out a transaction and there's this quasi proof of stake way of validating whether that transaction was valid or not. Okay, it's not it's not important uh, for us right now. But just know that there are other possible solutions other than proof of work to reach this. Um, so all that is to say that um, uh, all that is to say that a lot of the uh, technical solutions that will come in Monero, they're, they're not here yet. And we we should take advantage of the fact that it's still hard to onboard people because you know there's a sense in which we are still figuring things out the the reality of the case is although monero is definitely the most useful and most private cryptocurrency out there uh there's still things we're trying to figure out and there's no big issue if we don't get everyone in it uh at the same time so i want to make one passing um remark about adoption that is getting people into monero and i i would say in a lot of cases now of course if you if you are out there talking to every single person about Monero and how to get into it, that's fantastic. But I do think people have a tendency to look at adoption backwards. We're, we're trying to, we're basically trying to in, like get individual people to use it, whereas we focus less on like merchants, okay? And that, that's natural because there are more individual people than merchants. Um, now, one example, or, or another way to put it is, you know, we want to have kind of latent adoption of Monero. Even if people are not using it, we want them to be able to use it and know how to use it. OK, so one example of this is recently um, I actually don't know how it is in uh, Mexico, but in the United States, um, a lot of times people do people do this here where you like pay with your cell phone, you like tap on the. No, no OK. OK, so, well, uh, this is a good example then. So in the United States, we have a lot of things like Google Pay, Apple Pay, all this kind of stuff. It's interfaced with, interfaced with like the NFC thing on, on your cell phone. Basically, you can hook up a wallet to your cell phone and you just put it over the, the cashier and it will pay through your cell phone. OK, now that is not something that we now do. And a lot of people do this. This has come from nowhere in the past couple of years in the United, in the United States. Um, and it actually serves as a great example of adoption because what happened is Google or Apple, the companies that do this, that, that wanted to market this, they went to merchants and they said, hey, look, this is how you can accept it. We will give you, just put a sticker that says Apple Pay on this. We'll give you the software to adopt it and just put it out there. And by the same token, I think that's the way we have to kind of look at Monero. We want to look a lot of times at merchants, at people who accept money, uh, and we want to teach them, OK, this is how you can accept it, right? Well, one good example, I think, is my next slide, is you know, there's this software that called uh, BTC Pay, uh, which, of course, works with Bitcoin, but it works with, there's a Monero module as well, uh, where basically you can just spin up a little server that is a payment processor. It's a point of sale app in the same way that you know, a lot of people process credit cards. Um, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to do, it, it does everything automatically, in essence. And so um, when I say latent adoption, we want latent adoption of Monero. Um, I mean that we want to be in a position where everyone knows that it exists or theoretically could know that it exists, but they don't have to use it. And once they have a reason, once you have a normal person who could easily use Monero and you know it, it could be accepted by any merchant or anyone else and the technology is simple you don't even look you don't even have to look at those scary long monero addresses or maybe even a qr code i don't know qr codes scare people they scare me you know um, so making it you, we have to make technology base, basically as easy as possible and once we've done that adoption actually comes automatically once someone is like oh i understand why i would use this over cash or a credit card or a debit card or whatever um, okay, so closing out here. So um, I, I guess the goal again is you know, here's a Monero logo. Again, the point is, you know, one thing I actually have some tutorials that I've done on like creating websites and stuff. And one of the things I actually recommend to people is just whenever you make a website or anything online, just get a create a Man Monero wallet and just put your Monero address so that someone can tip you or donate to you. Now they probably won't if you're just some very small site, but it does increase the, I, I guess, uh, availability of Monero in the public conscience. And that's exactly when I'm talking about uh, merchants receiving, uh, you know, just, just 
go to a merchant, have him able to receive Monero, and subtly, when someone goes to the checkout and they see that logo, that is something, even if they don't notice, it's affecting the way that they look at things. And, oh, wait, there's this thing. I've, been, I've seen this symbol all, all over the place. This is actually a digital currency. I can pay for it. It's private. Um, I'm a custodian of my own funds, et cetera. Okay. Um, so anyway, that, that's, a, that's about it. Again, to uh, rehash, like um, it, telling people about freedom in computing and uh, digital currencies and privacy is not about sitting them down with like Austro-libertarian books and like lecturing them uh, in some like academic sense, okay? That, that's why I, I guess half you guys missed my, the beginning of my talk because uh, it happened so long ago. But, um, uh, you know, I was, I was talking about lecturing my drunk cousin who was wearing a kilt about Monero and Bitcoin because he asked. It's a difficult thing. But when, you're, when we're in a position where we have latent adoption, where the symbol is out there, people know that it exists and they know what it can do. Once you give them just a single teeny tiny reason to flip over and start using this thing, it all of a sudden makes sense. So I guess that's basically all I have to say. So thank you for listening. So. Yeah, we could take one or two questions. Do you have any questions in the audience? You want to jump up? In the meantime, yeah, you want to you get the slides up for the next speaker? Cool. All right. You could make your way up a little bit to the aisle. Yeah. Hi. Uh, what are good um, things to convince Americans to accept Monero? Uh, what do you mean? A good... Um, reasons of why you accept me. Accept oh, I think, me. I think the next talk's gonna be on that, right? So maybe I shouldn't step on that. Uh, maybe sh I shouldn't, wait till next time and you'll learn about that, I suppose. Yeah, we're gonna have a whole talk coming up next. Yes. Uh, Monero 101 in Spanish, maybe some English as well. Uh, any other talks for Luke, or uh, talks, any other questions for Luke? No, nothing? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can give one, you can give a doozy. You can give a funny one. So BTC Pay with Monero integration is working well, and this is ready for prime time, yep. small, medium-sized businesses around the globe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm, I have to say I've used it a little bit. I'm very impressed. I've, I've, do you work on BTC Pay or anything? Or Do I work? Just, oh, you just, okay. You're, you're not shilling it? For, I'm not a shill. Okay, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll shill it. I think it's great software. I, I think it's great. And I will say that I'll add this as well. Um, I know like there's definitely a good suspicion of people who are want to use like fiat portals for payment processing. But it would also be really convenient if there were all in one thing where you could have a payment processor that could process stuff via Square or Stripe and also do Bitcoin and Monero. That would be awesome because hey, you could just give it to someone to put on their iPad where they're processing transac transactions. That would be fantastic. So. I'm going to use this opportunity to put you on the spot. Okay. When's the uh, next YouTube video on Monero and the separation of church and state? Uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I barely do YouTube videos anymore, but uh, I don't know. Ch separation of church and state. I don't know. If like I... how it would play into like 501c3 and all that. Oh. Other. You, you are the guy to do the talk, man. You got to know that. Well, I don't, maybe we should, I don't, I, in the United States, maybe we should just call everything a religious organization so no one gets taxed. That would be a, a nice solution. Save it for the video. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I spoiled my content there. Um, all right. So anyone else before we? Yeah. Go ahead, man. Something I've thought of, I don't know if anyone's worked on it, is there any kind of work for like a physical way to exchange without like like an actual paper note that yeah. would pass Monero that could be taken off the blockchain, put back on the blockchain? Yeah. I don't know if I'm being clear with them. Yeah, no, I know. I've, I've thought about that. I've thought about exactly that because it would be very nice to transact value uh, in a physical form, if you don't have internet access or something. The only thing that I can think of, I don't know if anyone else has any ideas, but the only thing that I can think of is basically having a trusted party, like basically a Monero bank that is just well validated, that prints them, uh, which of course it's not like there's one bank, but but many of them that could participate. Um, so it wouldn't be like a, like a fiat system exactly, but it would be kind of like a fiat system. I, I think it would just be very hard to yeah. like, 
I, there might be some cryptographic magic that you could think up to to do something like that in a way that you couldn't just copy the bills. But um, yeah, that, I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, Last question. I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> I won't touch Apple Pay. I won't touch debit. Yeah. So the technologies that came up around, say, 20, 30 years ago, but I love Monero. Yeah. Any thoughts of what's going on here? Uh, you want me to psychoanalyze you or something? Yes. Why do you know. think somebody would adopt Monero and not adopt Apple Pay? It's because you're just so smart, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't. Well, the reality is, like, a lot of the pains of the credit card, debit card system, we're just so used to. And I think a lot of people are just used to them, you know, whereas. If you see the benefits of Monero and, you know, you get into it in a, a simple way, like it's something like, the, I mean, you know, I think I guess we were talking earlier about this. A lot of people we were talking about Linux um, where like a lot of people like, oh, man, I don't want to learn Linux. It's so hard. But then like they do it and it's like it's it's not really actually that hard. It's just one of those things. It's a, like Monero is alien to people, whereas debit stuff that seems normal. Um, but there are a lot of things, you know, the example I always, always use is like um, I always buy my cars on like. Craigslist, like from some person I don't know. And it's very hard to exchange a large amount of money like that. You can't just write a check unless you're going to wait like several days or like get a whole bunch of cash out of the bank, which looks suspicious. It'd be so much easier if we just used like Monero, you know? There's so many little optimizations that we'd get that I think people who are suspicious of it, they don't even think about like they wouldn't have to deal with this frustration. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd say. All right. I think that wraps it up. Big round of applause for Luke. Thank you. Luke, greatly, greatly apologize for the technical difficulties. That, that is all our fault. We're honored to have you, man. Seriously. Thank you. Two years in a row.